Thanks for being here. Uh, I think I'm talking for the whole team if I say that it's really cool to see um, the enthusiasm and participation and that you're all here to talk with us, talk block boards, uh, talk things related to trading and cryptocurrency. So for that, thank you. It's really exciting. <laughs> Applause for you. <laughs> um, just the basics. Um, there's going to be pizza at around 6. Um, you probably already found the beer, so that's a start. If you want to smoke, you can do that outside. It's a little bit cold, but it's probably still doable if you really want to. There's an ashtray. Um, the toilets are over there. Um, there's going to be one break, and in between the t my talk and the panel session after that, we'll maybe have like a, a minute or five so you can go to the bathroom and grab a drink. My mic is not that stable. Um, all right, so I'll just start by asking you a couple of questions to get to know you a little bit. Um, please raise your hand if you own BPT, our token. Cool, nice, participation, awesome. And then, um, who here has an actual account on Blockport, on our app? Well, I, to be honest, I didn't expect that, nice, awesome. And then a more difficult question, especially in these times, um, who has recently, this year, bought cryptocurrency? Cool. If, if someone is willing to say what currency, maybe even for what reason, um, someone that raised their hand, was it Blockport tokens? Was it Bitcoin? Was it something else? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. All right. It's understandable. <laughs> um, all right. Let's uh, start Blockport. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the future of Blockport. Um, I'm also going to touch the past a little bit. Our last meetup meet was in February this year, so it's been quite a while, actually, since we last spoke. Um, we did a lot of things. This meetup was actually organized right after our ICO, so we were really, really young at that time, and a lot has happened uh, ever since. So I'm going to touch the past a little bit. That's going to be the first part, so what happened and a couple of things that we've been through, actually, the past couple of months. Um, then I'll be talking about our vision, so throughout the past months, we have learned a lot of things we have done a lot of things, and based on that, we have kind of formulated a vision. It's pretty abstract. And then the third part will be the future of Blockport itself. It's going to be a little bit more specific into things that we are building and why we're building them, and uh, a little bit more into how we are going to build them and plan to actually expand and what our, what our major plans are. So that's going to be the content of this talk. Um, for those that don't know me yet, um, Hi, I'm Zoe. I'm one of the founders of Blockport. Sebastian and Kai are the other ones. They are joining a panel tonight. I'm also the CTO. Um, my day-to-day -day work usually involves a lot of aligning, uh, be it between development and ops, be it between product and development, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to include meetings, but also pushing security forward and certain standards. Um, and I'm a major believer in practices like DevOps and in culture, and that that eventually will influence the major and long-term success of every company to succeed not only in the product that they build, but also towards the users and the community that they try to foster. And that's particularly important for us. All right, so let's talk past and present. Um, a lot has happened, and a lot is happening at this point, and a lot will happen in the future. I'll try to go through that in that, in that format as well. Um, the current state, the past couple of nine, nine to 10 months, we have been able to We've been able to launch our products. We did this in July. We initially started with a private beta, so we had a couple of users onboarded there. Um, this gave us the opportunity to iterate and improve quite a lot of things before we actually went completely public with our products. So we've been through, through this phase and we've been through quite a couple of iterations already over the past few months. Um, at the same time, we grew to over 25 people. When we had the meetup in February, we already were a sizable team, but at that time, we also worked with an outsourcing company, so um, most of our developers and uh, teammates were actually not internal in a way, and we parallelized that to actually setting up an internal team and a culture and everything. Um, naturally, this also requires a new office because you have a lot of people working in the same place. We started at 2Q. Our office is literally over here, so this is where we do our day-to-day -day job, and how we produce what we produce nowadays. Um, it involves a, a ping pong table, definitely a major addition to the, to the team and to the office. Um, and over the past couple of months, something that I'm going to be talking a little bit about, uh, not only because I personally believe in it, because also we've seen that it just adds a lot of value to what we're doing, is DevOps. 
Um, this requires a lot of automation. It requires a lot of principles and standards. And we learn a lot of lessons throughout our, well, our short story now that will hopefully and likely be a lot longer. Um, obviously, with all these things, this includes a lot of learnings. We are a pretty young team. We're also a very young company. The whole crypto industry is super young, so it on its own moves really fast. Um, and we learned so many things around our users as well, because we set out to actually build based on our roadmap, and this roadmap is for one to two years. Um, this naturally complicates things when you actually want to deliver a lot of value. You have to reach out to your users and understand them, and likely they are not exactly the people that you expected them to be when you initially set out to build something. Um, and this has caused us to learn a lot of things, uh, not only the metrics, but also what users value and also what kind of minor, um, minor features we can include in the platform to improve the overall experience. Our growth strategy, um, of course, you get to know your users, you know you want to grow as a platform. Um, we ran into a couple of blockages because we can't actually do ads on Facebook and Google Ads. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the growth strategy later, but we definitely learned a lot of things in that regard as well. Uh, and our major focus for now, uh, another point I'm going to touch in this talk, is expansion and a lot of traction. So our focus, um, our focus has been throughout all the milestone, milestones I just mentioned, um, a lot on, on DevOps practices. And to be, to be fair, um, we started with a small team, so also small standards or no standards. Um, no process, really hard to get things done in some cases. It can be really chaotic, to be honest. Um, but it's, it's all about how you can actually iterate and improve on this fast enough and not be tied to all the things that you could have done better when you initially started. Because for us, of course, it was also a little bit of a crazy start in a way, right? You start out with um, ICO, funds, pretty big community, but you don't have a product yet. Um, you have to scale really fast. You have to deliver something based on a pretty aggressive roadmap. And this involves a lot of experimentation, and it involves mistakes. Uh, and you have to recover from these mistakes really fast. And so something that we internalize is DevOps, because it also allows us to iterate fast and uh, grow. So iterate and automate. Um, a lot of this iteration is uh, very much tied to the automation that we have. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, Basically, when you start out, you have a small team, one team also, that can push code, goes to a certain environment, and this can be done manually. But eventually, this code, you would want it in production. Uh, it needs to serve users, and users should be able to use that. This process um, for a developer that has all this access can be quite complicated, and it can result in, in issues, something that we actually had. Um, so you have, we have three environments, and one of our environments got completely destroyed uh, during just a random day. But because we iterated and automated, we were able to build it up completely within an hour. And this is a great example of expecting failure and be able to deal with it, and then reflect on it honestly with open feedback, and then say, OK, well, this is why it went wrong, because there was such an accident, but also because not enough things were automated at the time. Imagine a developer can write his code, push it, and he doesn't have to think at all about how it actually goes into production. That would probably prevent the whole mistake on its own. So these iterations and these reflections have caused us to actually be able to improve really fast. And that's something we're fostering and we've learned throughout the last couple of months a lot. Um, this very much relates also to reducing complexity. Complexity is perceived. So someone involved in the team in building something shouldn't be confronted with complexity that is unnecessary to what they're actually trying to achieve. And this, in turn, uh, if you want to solve this, leads to doing the right automation at the right time uh, and also making sure that you don't do unnecessary automation, of course. So there's always a balance to be struck in there. Um, and doing all these things and seeing how this evolved throughout the past couple of months to where we are at this point, um, you can see that the signal to noise ratio actually um, gets improved quite a lot. So imagine um, an environment being destroyed is <laughs> quite a clear signal. What you eventually want is to just uh, be solved and eventually evolve into a learning, just some factual process, uh, something that you can consistently improve on, and not necessarily discussions or arguments or a lot of vagueness around why it happened and could have happened. So you want to immediately analyze root cause and then go into solutions, action points, and decide on what you want to do with it. And uh, this is a really good way for an organization, especially for us that is growing really fast, where you always have a lot of noise. And the crypto industry itself also causes a lot of noise and a lot of doubt and uncertainty and such. So this is one of our principles, in a way, also to make sure that we can actually guide ourselves in somewhat of a right direction. Um, 
Of course, our focus has been on the team itself. We grew to uh, over 25 people, um, mainly engineers. It's still, and it already was at that time, a pretty engineering-focused culture. Um, makes a lot of sense because we are engineering something. Um, what is really cool is that we have a lot of skill in the team. Uh, I just did a, a really short calculation, and um, the 25 people in our team actually amount up to over 200 years of experience collectively, which is pretty cool for such uh, a young team on its own. And we believe and we already see that it's adding a lot of value. And this was something we actually set out to do. So it was part of our strategy to have a really senior team because we need to build something really effectively and really fast that is able to compete in an industry where a lot of money is being spent on doing things well. Um, massive learnings on the product development side as well. Um, we've been through quite a couple of iterations on that part, actually, and this very much also ties to the way we work. So we initially started with one team, quite a small team, um, so this means that you work pretty closely together. But the moment you actually scale to, say, 10 to 15 people, communication becomes harder, deployments become harder, uh, making sure that things are aligned becomes increasingly difficult. So then we decided, okay, maybe it's time to start splitting things up. We were a little bit inspired at that time by the Spotify model, so we thought, okay, we're going to split things up and look into guilds and tribes and all those terms that you now, nowadays have in these uh, buzzword kind of models. Um, this actually didn't work, so it kind of went to the background, didn't really happen. Um, I think also because we just weren't at that size yet and people, so the outsourcing company was still leaving, so there was a lot of change at that time. After that, we decided to actually iterate again. So we continuously have these feedback sessions also on how we work. Then we decided, okay, we're going to take a really free approach. We're going to focus on the epics, um, so the, the functional things that we want to add to the platform. We're going to take a fixed period for that, and we're just going to build through that and eventually see how well that went. We did that. This was, say, one and a half to two months ago. Another feedback session on that. We liked a couple of things of it. We took a couple of things away, and at this point, we actually are doing um, the already outdated but still effective Spotify model. So we have split it up into separate teams that are domain-specific, and we're also looking into having a form of board of advisors on certain things that are really important for us as a company that give independent advice to the whole team in terms of quality and security, uh, because these are fundamental aspects to how we think and how we believe we'll succeed. Um, product development-wise, this has had a really big impact because it also requires a lot of experimentation, not only with the way you work, but also how you build your features, who you communicate with, and what eventually comes out of that. Um, at this point, because this was the past, what are we doing right now? Cryptocurrency deposits, um, mainly Bitcoin deposits. This is something that we don't have now, so if you use Blockport, you can use, well, happy actually that a lot of you are already users, so you probably already know all this. Um, but you can use fiat and then buy cryptocurrencies um, and from that point, you can withdraw the cryptocurrency itself, or you can sell it for fiat, which is a recent uh, feature we added. But you can't actually use cryptocurrency you already have to store it at block ports uh, via a crypto deposit. So this is something we're building on, but it does require quite some reflection and analysis on the security implications, because this adds a lot of complexity also to the way you manage funds, especially because our model is not the traditional exchange. It's one that actually utilizes external exchanges for liquidity. So this complicated uh, things a little bit, and we were able to deal with it, but still something that we are working on. Matching engine. Um, I remember saying in February that we were moving this closer to uh, what we are doing at that time. We eventually decided not to do that yet, and this is a perfect example of us actually following the roadmap, but deciding based on feedback and experiment experimentation when we are going to build things exactly. Because up until now, things have been working fine. We have measured, we have seen that it didn't add that much value at that time, but actually right now, it does. So we are working on uh, iterating over that fast. And the cool thing is, because we made that decision, we were able to figure out a lot simpler model to actually iterate initially over a matching engine and hopefully progress further without creating something super complex that should be able to solve millions of transactions without actually having millions of users because everyone knows how the market is going now. Um, social trading, major part of our roadmap. Um, we've done modeling, we have done um, scenarios, trying to figure out exactly where all the complexities lie. And at this point, we are really closing in on deciding exactly uh, what we want to offer to our users. It's not crystal clear yet, but we've done the, fun, the analysis necessary to figure out exactly how we can add value and not build something, again, super complex that might not actually have a lot of immediate value to our users. And then um, security and quality as a standard and focus. So we've grown a lot. 
And we've built a lot, and we saw already that DevOps added a lot to the way we do things. Um, but eventually, you also run into not having maybe very particular or very specific standards. And what we see is that adding a lot of features is great, and it's, it's going to allow us to compete. And uh, on the other hand, you also see that competition is quite strong. And what is a major differentiator in our eyes is the quality and security you can consistently deliver. So that's something we are trying to stabilize and continuously focus on within the company to make sure that we can actually ensure that not only your, our users' funds are safe, but also everything that we do as an organization, because it involves a lot more than only the users' funds, even though that's the major um, thing we are trying to protect. So this was more or less a story based on what we have done and what we're doing at this point. So I'll move into the kind of the second part, which is our vision. Um, we can see that crypto is going places. Um, there are a lot of projects upcoming. There are some projects doing really well. Some other projects are not doing that well. Um, it's diverging. It's going in all kinds of crazy directions. And a lot of value is already, ha has been already been pumped in over multiple, well, bubbles in a way, because it's a lot of extrinsic value, we also believe. Um, so, and this very much relates to there being a lot of noise. It's, it's, I mean, there were a lot of ICOs, there were exit scams, there is so much going on, so many ways funds are being managed properly or improperly, um, being valued or overvalued, undervalued, um, and this, Im this insane fast rise of complexity also in the ecosystem just causes a lot of noise and it's hard to actually see where the real value lies, not only for investors but also for us as a company. Um, but what we also can clearly see is that the ecosystem is progressing. Something is happening. And eventually, we believe things will stabilize and eventually will separate into things that are intrinsically valuable. And this is something that still needs a lot of effort and something we believe we are creating as well. And the things that are maybe a little bit undervalued. Um, we have to hodl and we have to keep biddling. That's definitely something that we have to always do. And that's also something we set out to do. So regardless of what is happening in the market or other projects, we are certain that we need at least two to three or maybe more years to validate whether what we are doing is actually adding value. Because it's really easy to say that based on projections and such and markets such and such, um, that it might not be a good idea to do certain things. But we also know that the whole ecosystem and the whole integration and adoption of blockchain and cryptocurrencies, therefore, needs a lot of time. So we decided we're going to stick to what we have set out to do, and we're going to focus, and we're going to make sure that we keep on doing this um, while experimenting and, and continuously learning from the actual um, scenarios or situations that we run into with our users and our potential partners and such. To add on this as more or less a conclusion, um, a really important indicator for us is that, and we often internally also compare it every now and then with what happened with the internet. Um, so the internet is based on protocols, right? And we nowadays use it in, well, for nearly everything. Uh, the amount of connected devices is insane. Um, but we are not really aware of this complexity when we actually use it. And this is a really good indicator of what something as fundamental and also expansive as blockchain or the internet, which is a very complicated set of protocols, should be able to do before it can actually go into mass adoption. So it should be as simple as using the internet, opening your browser, using an app, etc. And that's a good way to measure whether we are actually ready for mass adoption. Um, and this, this kind of relates to, maybe uh, some of you know that there are a couple of theses going on uh, around where blockchain is going to go or might go. And one of them is FAT protocols, where you saw that certain manual aspects of communication were actually um, delegated to protocols, which is kind of the internet at this point. Um, and I also believe, and we also believe, that what you see now is that there is a potential for delegating, again, certain things of value, value exchange, store of value to a protocol and not to organizations managing this. And this is kind of decentralization. But it can go also to a lot of other directions. Because eventually, if you have the FAT protocol thesis becoming a truth, then you can say, OK, but people need to interact with these stores of values and need to exchange value. So this then becomes into uh, FAT wallets, which is another uh, idea that there's going around. And then you have FAT DFs, which is another concept, but I'm not going to get into that. So what is it all really for? Like, it's, it's, it's sometimes quite difficult to actually, also for us maybe even, to say, like, OK, we know that we have to hodl, and we know that we have to biddle, and we have to do this for a couple of years, but it's not really sure for us 
where we're going and where do we get feedback from. We have some users, but what is the whole purpose of, of, of everything? Um, and basically, the conclusion keeps on being we just need more time. Um, regulation is something that we need to wait for, and we need to expect it, and we need to prepare for it, and actually, we need to hope for it, because it's also an indicator of a form of stabilization, and this stabilization is absolutely necessary to actually get to the level that I was just describing uh, related to the internet. Um, and then again, the speculation itself is not a bad thing, because what it, this extrinsic value, this, this appreciation of things that might not intrinsically be that valuable, is still a great way to actually get funds or energy in a way of value into these projects that are being developed. Some of them good, some of them bad, but it, this, this more or less chaos will eventually evolve into a certain order um, where we believe that this is actually what we need to wait for because then you start to see the actual value that is potentially being added. And this, this is going to take years, we expect. Um, and on top of that, it doesn't really work yet blockchain, right? So there's a lot of potential in there, but does it actually solve these problems? Well, it's not close to doing the same as the internet. So we need a lot of experimentation with models, models of incentivizing participants to networks, be it miners. Well, I mean, there are alternatives, proof of stake. We need to experiment with that as well. There's a lot of advancement going on there around Ethereum too. Um, but again, this takes a lot of time. And there are so many potential models that you can build on top of blockchain. Um, but we still need to figure out exactly how they work and experiment with them. And again, that's going to take years. Um, so like I said, they need validation and testing. What we also see is that at the heart of this, whether you have a microeconomy, um, a new project with its own token, um, or some consortium chain being uh, applied by organizations, banks, whatever it may be, um, at the heart of this, to actually get to a certain form of mass adoption, you would need exchanging. People hold these tokens maybe because they participate in a network, they share content, they get paid for streaming their own video, for vlogging, for example. This is a, a real life use case. Um, these tokens, to actually use them to travel or buy your groceries, you would eventually still need to exchange them, but you want to do that in a seamless way um, that actually allows you to do this without thinking about the complexity that is actually underneath. And this is one of our major goals, is to be the backbone, um, the bridge between the crypto world and the fiat world, because fiat is not something you can think out of, the, out of the world, right? It is something that's there. It is very much related to regulatory things and also to taxes. Um, and this is something that we believe is uh, a fundamental thing that we can add to the ecosystem and add to this whole progression of blockchain and crypto. Um, so very hard of collaboration because it's interoperability. So I mentioned value quite a lot of times. And like I said, it's being accrued, and it's, but it's going slow. Um, we need a lot of time to fail, uh, to experiment with models of incentivizing users and participants, um, with dApps to actually see if we can build dApps that are better than normal applications that we have. And that's quite difficult. And to be honest, this is a personal opinion. I don't think we're there yet and not even close. But uh, you can still very much see that a lot of development tools are being created. And um, it's a very, very technical concept, blockchain on its own. And to actually add the value that we eventually need, you need to build a lot of stuff. Um, and this is going at a, at a high pace. And the people that are working on this are incentivized also because there are just a lot of money pumped into these projects. And that's something we've already been through. That's just a reality. It's going to come because there is already value in there. It just needs some time. Um, Regulations uh, adds a lot of value. We believe in that, we still do, and we have hopes for how it's going to end up. It could definitely mean setbacks at some point, but it's also up to us to adapt and not actually have one straightforward vision and try to push that forward really strictly. Um, we have to be flexible in a way to make sure that we are nimble enough to adapt to these regulations and make sure that we can um, hopefully prosper within them and inform to make sure that these are applied correctly and also with the insight that is necessary to formulate good regulation. Um, so like I already mentioned, there's a lot of development investment going on as well. Um, proof of work, we probably already all know what that is. There's a lot of experimentation going on the proof of stake. Um, I've been watching a project called Cosmos um, a little bit. It's built on top of Tendermint. Uh, there are a lot of advancements going on around there. They actually did a pretty good release. Um, and if you look at the uh, implementation that Ethereum 2 is going towards, this is well, more or less an alternative. And what they're also planning to do is hard spooning, which is not, well, obviously not hard forking. Um, but the idea is that they actually take 
um, every holder of Ethereum, um, and they create a chain on top of Cosmos, Cosmos Hub, or they, in this case, they call it Ethermint, um, and actually every holder of Ethereum tokens um, is still one in that chain, and it is on basically a, a copy of transactions, but because it's interoperable with Cosmos itself, people can utilize this project to actually do cross-chain transactions, even with uh, Ethereum holders. And this can also go as far as Bitcoin and all, all kinds of other chains. And again, this is experimental, right? So it's an idea, it's not there, it's not mainnet yet. People are not actively using it, but it's a lot of potential. Um, and on top of that, the development ecosystem. So to build all these things and to make these projects go forward, you also need a lot of tools, you need meetups, you need communities. And also in that regard, we see a lot of uh, things happening and a lot of new tools being created um, and new open source projects being stimulated, not only by funding, but also just participation out of interest. So the past topics were mostly from the cryptocurrency ecosystem perspective, right? So we are a cryptocurrency exchange, so most of the things we view um, or we perceive are based on our projections of what we think is going to add a lot of value. But what is easy to forget is that the actual mass adoption um, is made out of very normal people that literally have no idea what all this stuff does, and they shouldn't, to be frank. Um, so again, we need to inspire trust, not only for these users, but also for regulatory um, for regulators and also for banks and other large institutions that are having a great impact on how this eventually could turn out. So a fundamental aspect of that, in our opinion, is quality. Um, you need to have stable quality, so also reliability. It means that your app should work. Um, it means that it should do what you say it does and shouldn't crash like a lot of projects still do. Um, it's not deterministic. You can't really expect something from it yet because it's just not clear. Fundamental to that is security. Uh, we are dealing with exchange of value, with exchange of funds, and also storage of this. Security is fundamental to that, so that's also one of the reasons we are going for hybrid decentralization, um, because, to be frank, we don't want to be responsible for your money. Ideally, we make you responsible for your money in such a way that you are actually also informed enough to do so. Because, again, just hybrid decentralization, you holding your own private keys, doesn't necessarily always mean that it's going to be safer, because if you have no idea what to do with them and you store them in an unsafe way, it's still a major risk. So, again, UX becomes a really fundamental part, and that's where the quality comes in. Um, hybrid organization. So, I've been talking a little bit about hybrid decentralization, um, but in line with the FAT protocol thesis, we also believe that we need organizations to adopt blockchain, to actually become organizations that delegate part of the responsibility and, and the autonomy that they have to a protocol such as blockchain, but build their fundamental public role as well because you need to be extremely efficient as an organization. And governance models in a lot of crypto projects are not efficient enough to actually compete with organizations that have had years of experimentation and funding and trainings and you name it to be extremely efficient in delivering customer experiences and stability in dealing with that. So we need to create a hybrid model where we can still function as a traditional organization and do the things right that they are doing right, while delegating really important responsibilities to something that we can trust more than people, which is a protocol. Um, so then the future. I think I already briefly mentioned this, but we are mainly focusing on traction and expansion at this point. Um, it's also because we see that this is going to be the fundamental differentiator. We also see that our conversion rate is really, really high compared to other projects, which is a great thing. On the other hand, there's a lot of competition out there, so we need a lot of exposure. And that's also where our growth tactics, growth hacking, which is something we've always done and are still uh, investing a lot of time and effort in, um, is something that we believe is going to add a lot of value. Um, and part of this is, uh, for example, the strategy of influencer marketing, because we had a couple of blockages about not being able to run ads on uh, Facebook and Google, uh, Google AdWords, which is something we heavily utilized during our ICO, not able to do so anymore. Um, but you can use a lot of, you can um, find out a lot of ways around this, right? So one of them is influencer marketing. So what we are planning to do is use uh, soccer players to um, share Blockport in multiple ways and combine this with the referral campaign. So referral systems are proven to work. Um, they're quite efficient, have been done by uh, companies like Dropbox and PayPal. Um, and if you combine these two, where you get a lot of people through your platform through social influencers, but then also get these people in your referral campaign, they can in turn share 
a lot of things around Blockport and actually earn some money with that. So that is ideally something that we can gain a lot of traction by. Um, oh yeah, more utility is really important. Um, at this point, the BPT token uh, can be used to get discounted trading fees, but there's a lot more to be gained there. We're going to use it in the social trading model. Um, so you, as a trader, if you have copiers, you can get paid in BPT. Uh, but there are so many more extra utilities, and we also believe that us, as an organization that will um, bridge between crypto and fiat, we are aiming to make BPT a part of this as well, where you can utilize our token also to integrate with not only crypto projects, but also other uh, partners and companies that are a lot more traditional. Um, wider offering of services, alternative investment methods. So at this point, like I said, um, you can buy cryptocurrencies, you can exchange them. We don't have very advanced trading features because that's not our uh, primary focus. But we also are quite interested in alternative ways to invest. Um, we don't have a lot of clarity on that yet, but we are looking into a couple of models. And this could mean that it's also a lot easier. And actually, a form of alternative investment, in our eyes at least, is the uh, copy trading. So you imagine um, bundles, for example, where you can have a set of cryptocurrencies that you can uh, basically follow without thinking exactly about what these currencies do. And you don't have to actually open Blockport every day to do this. And this is a way to make it a lot more attainable for users and create a low barrier to entry. Um, partnerships, uh, being a bridge, that means that you actually have to bridge between certain things, and those things being other projects that exist, um, and of course, uh, traditional companies. So that means anything from being maybe market makers, banks, to just uh, crypto companies or, or uh, a project, sorry, that we have listed on our exchange, which is also part of our marketing tactic. So to list tokens and actually collaborate with them to share Blockport and that they're listed on our exchange. Um, like I said, a referral program is a very fundamental part. And we also see that not only the social influencers uh, are going to attribute a lot of that, but we can also go into a lot of other ways to get people on the platform and get into the funnel of the referral uh, program. Um, and again, focus is essential. It's really hard to lose focus with all these options and also to give ourselves direction into what we are offering towards our users because we can set up a lot of marketing campaigns, but if the product itself maybe does not work or it doesn't add the features or have the features that people actually want to use, then there's not really a lot of value and that's where the conversion ratio is going to drop. So that's a major point of focus for us as well. And this means that we need to focus on excellent execution and strategizing. Basically coming down to um, not hurrying when you are not sure something is a good plan. Uh, and definitely when you know something is a bad plan, just simply don't do it. Uh, and it's easy to be, you know, FUD and FOMO and everything can guide you towards doing things too fast. Um, in our case, we decide to take a step back, maybe take a day, maybe take two, and figure out exactly what a good plan is to do things. And again, this is where DevOps comes in because you can experiment and iterate really fast. You can recover from things that you've done. You can learn really fast and therefore also increase the amount of output you get for these experiments. Um, so as we're trading, obviously, really big part of our future. Like I said, we've done some scenarios and some modeling. And what we have seen is that um, through doing simulations, um, we need very clear iterations of how we are going to introduce this and bring this to market. Because uh, something like copy trading is complicated, not only to build, but can also be quite complicated for users actually to utilize. Um, you can easily describe it like, yeah, you're going to follow a trader, but then what happens if this trader does a deposit? How does the portfolio distribution uh, end up? And what are the risks involved in that? And what if you do really small transactions, but you have to pay fees for that? To work out all these things is really easily going to look like we're doing waterfall model, and we have to project exactly what we're going to build with all the risks calculated in uh, for the coming six months. So that's something we decided to not do, but actually iterate um, and focus on what users really, really want. And what we believe users really want, and again, experimenting and learning, so we might figure out that there's um, a more specific explanation we can give to what users really want. But what we believe is that they just don't want to worry. Uh, they want to save money um, and ideally have a higher ROI than they can currently have. Um, not think about exactly how these things work and also maybe not even have too much to do with the traders that they are following. So this is, for example, the bundles thing I mentioned is something that we're exploring, and we are closing in on actually deciding exactly what our structure is going to be for rolling this out. Of course, decentralization, um, one of the primary goals as well. We 
aimed to focus uh, a lot of decentralization a little bit earlier, but what we also saw is we need a lot of users and we need a lot of traction. Um, we decided to continue research, um, although passively, um, been doing so not only within the team, but also with others and getting information from people that are interested. Um, and we are closing in on figuring out what a potential model could be to, to build this initially. Um, and decentralization of our trading infrastructure is one thing, but you can decentralize a lot more, right? There are a lot of projects out there that actually kind of offer you the same thing that serverless does nowadays. So you can run things in a serverless fashion, not managing infrastructure in the cloud. Um, you can get more or less the same guarantees if you run things on chain, certain projects, of course. So this is something that we're also potentially looking into. How can we utilize the blockchain more and more in an effective way to bring Blockport to market efficiently and integrate it with our own practices. Um, we also see that a lot of projects have matured, but are also still maturing and not closing in on the level that we need them to be to get to this eventual state of being as simple as the internet. Um, we are heavily focused on user experience. We are heavily focused on quality and security. So using a project that is not completely stable would not be a very wise decision because it's actually not one of our goals even though decentralization is. So we're continuously keeping an eye on that and continuing research. Um, so well, this is exactly what I just said, and we are still experimenting. Um, regardless, our full kickoff of this is going to be in 2019. We're certain of that. And we also believe that the projects that are out there are maturing fast enough to base these assumptions on. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, there are many options out there. Databases decentralized that are relatively efficient can do quite some querying as well. Maybe not as good as a traditional database you would run in the cloud with just a couple of button clicks, but it could still add a lot of, add a lot of value to decentralizing our trading infrastructure. Um, so a recap on all the things that I've mentioned because I've more or less been through everything. Um, we believe that we should all foster growth. Growth is essential to where we eventually want to be. Um, this means signal to noise ratio is essential. We have to make sure that we are going towards something that is clear, that we are experimenting and that we measure growth really effectively. Um, strategy is vital. So again, signal to noise, we shouldn't be distracted. Um, we shouldn't be inside of states of, or in states of FOMO and, and be sensitive to, to FUD. Uh, we have to make sure that we actually know what we're doing, why we're doing it and also get into tactics exactly on how we're going to do it. And again, hodl and biddle. Uh, just keep on strong for the coming years and make sure that you, you all know that this eventually is going to happen. It's quite hard to deny that. In what way, we don't know. We'll have to be flexible and iterative, but it's definitely going to become a reality and it's going to add value. Thank you.